Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here at Coltish. For any of you who don't know, we have a merchandise store. If you've seen any of our cool designs, uh, a lot of people have gotten the Bad Theology Hurts People. Uh, you can get the T-shirts. You can get all sorts of hoodies, uh, tank tops, stickers, all that. If you want to check that out, go to shopcoltish.com. You can check out all our merch. We'll be getting new designs hopefully soon, so make sure you check that out. Also, if you are interested in supporting Cultish, we would not be able to do this program without your support. You can go to the uh, go to the donate tab. There's uh, you can donate one time or monthly. There also should be some links in the description. And also uh, make sure you go to apologiastudios.com. Uh, if you become an all access member, you'll get some great additional content and also they'll support the studio which also make cultish a possibility and also don't forget to check out forgedbeardco.com you go to forgedbeardco.com forward slash cultish you can get some great goodies for your beard or friend who has a beard and y'all you'd also a portion of that will go towards this ministry all right so this is the second part of our conversation that we had with uh, bradley from uh, the YouTube channel God Loves Mormons. We had a great conversation and really had a great time. It was up in Harriman, Utah, where Andrew resides in his little super secret headquarters. So uh, we hope you enjoy the second part of this conversation. Enjoy the podcast. Widening back door of Mormonism today, but those people aren't necessarily ending up in true churches. Right. With, with the gospel, they're ending up, you know, just like after 1975 with Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, you had over a million people leave the Watchtower of Alvin Tract Society in the next few years. Mm-hmm. Ninety-nine plus percent of them are the religiously abused. They did not end up in a true church. They've ended up just out there, mm-hmm. uh, no longer listening to anybody. Right. And so uh, that's that's a tragedy. Yeah. And in fact, sometimes those people are harder to reach than the people who are still actively believing yeah. the church. All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen to cultish entering the kingdom of the cults my name is jeremiah roberts one of the co-hosts here and uh, i'm always joined here by into the super sleuth of the show and we are also joined here from brand by brandon from bradley bradley it's okay Campbell. you know yep. <laughs> yeah i almost Hold always on. say i almost always but, say bradley cooper because of the famous guy yeah. i totally said that when we were at uh i know we're gonna restart i just have yeah. to say it real quick we were when we were at General Conference, I was like, yep, and Bradley Cooper's going to be here later. And I was like, why did I say that? <laughs> Bradley Campbell. Yeah. Yeah, Bradley. All right, start okay. again. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish, entering the kingdom of the cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here. I am joined here by my trusted co-host and super sleuth, Andrew, the super sleuth of the show, and your super secret headquarters in your apartment in Harriman, Utah. <laughs> <laughs> my secret, not so secret Headquarters now in my apartment in Harriman, Utah. Yes, Jerry. Yes. If I get shot, remember that you told everyone where I was, okay? Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so this is part two of uh, the second volume of the Postmodern Maze of Mormonism. Uh, we are joined here uh, once again by Bradley from uh, God Loves Mormons, the, your YouTube channel. Good to have you back on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. So just real quickly, that context, uh, if you're listening to this via audio, uh, that is a conversation that uh, Pastor James White, uh, you know, I go to Apologia Church, so he's my pastor, was talking with my other pastor, Jeff Durbin, really just about the current state of affairs, and this is several years ago. And uh, for anyone of you, uh, you wondering, uh, the music in the background, that is there because that's part of the uh, Easter pageant production, which is finally happening this year, which I'm super excited for. But just real quickly, um, since you're kind of our guest here, give us, give me your thoughts on everything that James said. Uh, unpack that from your perspective. Yeah. What first comes to mind about that? Wow. I, every word he said, I was like, yep, yep, that's exactly, exactly right. Uh, the dumbing down of Mormonism, the the watering down of their beliefs, their practices, their theology is um, widespread. There are very few, very few people that I have interacted with who wholeheartedly cling to the doctrines of Mormonism. What, what uh, I, I think it was uh, Pastor Jeff who said, uh, you have to first convince them, uh, convert them to Mormonism, to them, uh, yeah. then, 
you know, share the gospel with them. That is, we use that line all the time because that is exactly true. People are so watered down in their understanding and grasp of theology that they don't realize how much of a problem it is. They don't think on the level of, well, is this true? It does it correspond with reality? Does it, is it actually derived from uh, scripture or is it just this kind of idea that we like thinking about and is interesting? It's become more of a hobby for lots of Mormons than actual, the, the foundational bedrock of their, uh, worldview and, mm-hmm. uh, and and their practices. And so, man, I, uh, like I was saying, I almost never interact with anyone who actually clings to Mormon doctrine. Uh, the Gospel Library, I, I keep with me uh, in my evangelism bag an old version of uh, Gospel Principles mm. so that I can go to the last chapter on exaltation and walk through, here's what you think about exaltation. Here are the requirements for exaltation, and here's what the Bible says. Literally right. doing that exact thing. So I think that is incredibly true. The back door of Mormonism is, uh, is not, it is so wide right now. Uh, people are leaving the church in droves, especially since uh, COVID started and uh, they shut down the churches. There are tons of people who I uh, know personally, relationally, who were gung-ho for the church prior to that. And then they're like, wait, the temples were always really important. That was a big thing. And then they're shut down. That's like a really significant part of our church. And they are uh, on the cusp of being done with it all. And so, uh, yeah, and they're headed straight for atheism. All of them, mm. straight for it. Atheism or New Age spiritualism are kind of the two categories that people are, are sprinting towards. So one of the things I had no idea about, and this is just, it's like, this is not without a sense of irony. I mean, God, almost God has a sense of humor, is that I found out that the um, all the video, the promotional LDS videos, the, the character that plays Jesus, he's an actual guy who lives here locally. And he's like this new, he's like super into the new age. Um, it's possible I talked with him yes. in Provo. Brandon was talking to us about how you guys met yep, him. Yep, okay. So you were there. With <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, totally. Yeah. It was a weird conversation. He was like, I'm Jesus. And mm-hmm. I was like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> right. That's a couple of questions. Deep. Wild. Yeah. Very much. It's almost like you have a very common, like postmodern uh, view of the world. And in many ways too, like that's a lot of too, where like where Joseph came from, like he was heavily involved uh, in the occult. You know, it's a matter of public record that he was arrested for treasure digging uh, with, with a Smith. That's what his family was prominently known for. You can see that if you want to read a fascinating book, you can read uh, no man knows my history by Fawn Brody, excellent resource, but yeah, he was heavily into that. And so in many ways you can't not, no matter how much one tries to revise Mormonism or try and whitewash their history, you can't get away from the the dark areas of dark origins, whether it's like the Masonic connections to uh, the temple or whether it's Joseph Smith's involvement in the occult or really just the origins of the idea of baptism for the dead. If we just call a spade a spade, that's necromancy. That's really attempting to contact the dead. And there's plenty of people I know who had, like I've talked with Mormons who have had experiences talking with what they believe to be their ancestor, which ultimately biblically are familiar, are familiar spirits. Yep, yeah. Tons. Do you have an example of that? Oh man, I, I have not, uh, dozens, uh, I'm not exaggerating. Dozens of people, um, have cited, uh, temple visions of family members or something like that, uh, either that they had or that a close family member of theirs had. And that was the bedrock of their worldview. Mm-hmm. That experience, the bedrock. Um, oh, I saw, you know, great grandma, uh, Jody, uh, when I was in the celestial room and, um, you know, and they don't go into much detail, but they're like, and, and, uh, I knew that what I was doing was for her and I knew that it pleased God. So I know that yeah. the church is true and so on and so forth. And I got to be like, guys, ha- you need to read first John four, um, beware of false spirits. We know that they exist. You need to test the spirits. That's the biblical command. So that is very pervasive. Uh, very, very, very much more so than I thought. It's kind of almost shockingly so, because I would have thought that that was, um, honestly, if coming out here, if you would have told me that, it would have been like, oh man, that's probably made up or a whipped up emotionalism would have been my guess. But I've heard it enough times and I'm like, there might be some spiritual uh, stuff going on here with some legitimate demonic deception. I've heard it enough times. Yeah. Mm. No, that that's huge. I think um, one one area that's really interesting too is that uh, when it comes to like the new age and really the occult, and and even a commonality that it has with people, people we talk from that from that area, like you're just at the Hare Krishna temple outreach, is that um, 
you know, the, their primary authority in that world is experience. Yep. Um, and, and very, very, emo- very, not just experience, but also very, very emotion, very, very emotional. Uh, those things too, those, two, those two things go together. And then many ways, like that's what they hold together as far as like being authoritative. And so totally where the doctrine can change, it's always founded in this emotionalism. Like we were just talking with two missionaries or two nice, uh, kind young men. And you know, one of the guys started really talking about his testimony, started getting teary eyed. And that's one of the things too, when you're talking with a cultist is that sometimes, you know, it talks in Proverbs about, you know, one, if you have, basically, if you have a word that you want, if you've already made up your mind what you're going to say next, and you're not actually listening to the person, like, that, that's condemned. And so you need to actually, like, listen to them mm-hmm. and hear their out. Well, you don't have to affirm it. You can acknowledge the fact that they've had this experience. But that's really where you see this postmodern maze of modernism going, where it's just very, it's so experiential. Um, so regardless of the changes, they're always going to, Pin back, pinpoint their current experience, and that's going to be their authority. And, and you know what? The the LDS centralized church uh, has over a hundred billion dollars. Like, if you think even about like the temple endowment ceremony when they go through those things, those are experiences that they're using. They they pay for these buildings with their money to get people to go in there to have a tangible physical experience that is tied to their spirituality. Yeah. So that's what they do. It, 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 it literally entraps you. It enslaves you. If you think about it, yep. like they're they're, and they have enough money to do it. Yep. That's what blows by mm-hmm. mind. Like in that, the comment from pastor James in the beginning, he says like, what if there's like a, a, someone who comes and says, I was given the priesthood here. This is how you guys are failing. I still have it and tries to restore it. Well, he's up against a hundred billion dollars. Yeah. Like how does that work? And that that's very an interesting thing to think about in between the LDS organization and the true Christian church, where we're not to have a centralized uh, net of income area. We're supposed to have different churches in different areas with local people, local problems with the local tie that handles local problems and solutions. Now we have this entity with over a hundred billion dollars. How does that work in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, You know, I I'm thinking this, um, emotionalism that has become the foundation of Mormonism is so widespread that I think that the result, the downstream result of this is doctrine can almost be done away with Mm. almost essentially. Um, I I think that there are um, not just in the future, but right now thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps maybe even millions of Latter-day Saints, especially in Utah, um, though probably also outside of Utah, who um, care not at all about doctrine, not even a little bit because of their emotional, uh, experiential uh, grasp on the church. And so all the church provides them is experiences that then reaffirm their system, their worldview. And so the thing that keeps them trapped in this institution is not doctrine. It's not that the doctrine is appealing. In fact, the doctrine is very unappealing to lots of people, especially in the younger generations. They could care less about the doctrine and and some of the stuff they're like, that's weird. I don't even like that. I don't want to do anything with that. But the experience, the emotion, uh, emotional um, bedrock of everything is is going to become, I think, the new mainstream Mormon um, culture yeah. uh, doctrine. Honestly. It's it, it's super interesting because we see Scientology does the same thing, right? So, for example, Jerry told me the the Mesa Temple finally is done. They finally rebuilt it, and on the inside, it looks like an Apple Store now. <laughs> no, the visitors the, the visitor, visitor center, center looks oh, like oh, an oh. Apple Store. It's it's super like every aspect you see, like the with all that kind of futuristic minimalist. Like they have the, this is the weirdest thing. They have these like tubes. There, there's little tubes or containers, and you can like walk in there. And it's super quiet, and they're like these prayer tubes that you can like walk inside. It's the weirdest thing. Wait, like so, like you hope, go inside to pray. Yeah, in the visitor center. Yeah, in, in Mesa, there are these small little like they're like, clear. And you, you, you open up the door and you can still see outside, but it's super quiet inside. So it's almost like oh. one of those like isolation tanks or something. And you go That's in there, so it's, it's the weirdest thing, but yeah. it's super postmodern, super minimalistic. But mm. on the inside, when we got to do the walkthrough of the temple in Mesa, it was just interesting because it, it looked like a really fancy like retirement home. Yeah, like inside, hotel ins- lobby. Hotel yeah. lobby. Like this is kind of like, where everyone goes who is on the Lawrence Welk show is going to go to hang out. And I'm like, I'm that's way, way back then. It just kind of shows you just, yeah, they, but they're putting like tons and tons of money into this. But let me ask you this. When it comes to just the 
financial decisions about where the Mormon church is and where they're headed, it's pretty, I think it's very indicative that the church membership is in decline uh, in yeah. many different ways. But they're building temples everywhere. They're Isn't doing like 17. We're announced. We're announced. Yeah, they Wild. got they got one uh, right on the side of the highway when I was driving in here that's under construction. And like, why do you think that is? Why are they building so mm. many temples? Yeah, there, I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first is to give the appearance of growth, uh, even though there isn't any. Uh, I think that they really want they, they have this rah rah, um, you know, let's 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 make people think that things are really great, that we're growing and we're expanding and announcing new temples gets, you know, the whole community excited and people are like, yeah, our church is advancing when the reality is actually quite different. So I think it's kind of a morale boost in one sense. But I've also heard that when a temple is placed in a community, it is a hard fact that their tithing uh, goes up in that mm. community that, that it actually, there is a tie between uh, temples being built and uh, tithing faithfulness. If you think about it, if you're tied to the tithe, uh, <laughs> yeah. if, if you're a, um, you know, Latter-day Saint who's in the community and you're kind of invested uh, and then suddenly down the road, there's going to be a temple and, you know, temples are like the pinnacle of uh, not just doctrine, but also the emotional experience component we were just talking about. Um, that's a good way to get a person only half invested, invested. Hey, come, hey, come to the temple more often. You can walk here. You, it, it's your community uh, members, your neighbors, uh, your ward is going to be here regularly. You can take your youth group here. And so people end up getting roped into more of the practices of the church, making them more, um, in, you know, uh, inclined to practice, be, be temple worthy, tithe and whatnot. So yeah, I think there's a financial component. I think there's a morale component. Um, and then also I think it's a, uh, like we were just talking about, a way to increase the emotional uh, experience uh, experiences in the, the regular membership. Um, temples are where people have their greatest ties to Mormonism. Uh, you have to deal with people's emotional encounters in the temple at some point. When I was baptized for, you know, my, my grandmother, I, I just felt, I knew that what I was doing was honoring to the Lord. And so I, I, I know what you're saying in the Bible here about, uh, you know, the, the nature of God and salvation, but I, I felt that uh, my grandma was there with me when I was baptized. And so Getting more people into the temples, uh, mm -hmm. emphasizing that more, creates more of a sticky pool of, of emotional entrapment that then people have to mm -hmm. wade through when they're coming out of the church. It, it closes, limits the back door, I think, a little bit. Wow. Yeah. Um, so one area, too, that you're talking about just current events and how COVID affected uh, the Mormon church and its growth. Um, obviously, we know a lot of the conversations around COVID was extremely like we were already very polarized as a nation yeah. and even just in the world in general, I think COVID in many ways already brought out into the forefront. Like all of a sudden the YouTube comments that were in anonymity, like they turned into real people in the year of 2020. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a great way yeah, to say it. It's, but if you think about it, so, you know, there's the whole conversation about, you know, should you wear a mask? Should you not wear a mask? Um, and, and again, we're not going to get into that. Like the point is that was extremely polarizing. Yeah. You, you had uh, the whole, the, the Black Lives Matter with all the different riots and cities burning down. There's a lot of, there are people rioting in downtown Salt Lake when, when this was happening. Yep. So that was another example of polarization, but in all reality, and who knows, maybe our video will be demonetized because we're mentioning it, the vaccine, um, regardless of how you feel about it, um, whether or not you should or should not take it, uh, it was, it, it was extremely polarizing. Yeah. And so when you had uh, Russell Nelson, Russell Nelson come out yeah. And with him having a history as a doctor and saying and endorsing it. And I remember seeing, you know, this picture of him getting the shot. Um, yeah. And then, you know, with he, I think he was like wearing a mask when he's gone. That's like the typical shot. When, yeah. The typical know. shot, pun intended. Yeah. The Photoshop. Virtue of it. signaling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, when you come out, you're not necessarily saying I'm the, I'm, you're not speaking as a prophet, but you're still God's prophet. You're speaking as a doctor. Yep. And I know people that I spoke with who actually were LDS, who said that that was extremely, they weren't unsure of what to do because there's a lot of people in in the Mormon world that are very uh, naturopathic, very uh, health-oriented. Mm -hmm. and They have the word of wisdom about health stuff a lot of right, times, you know? Right, and so I'm just making a point that I think that was another example of something just culturally that their experience, everyone's experiencing polarization. I think culturally, that's a major example of what the Mormon church is dealing with as far yeah. as, as far as polarization goes. Yeah. Um, to comment on that, uh, I know 
exactly what you're talking about. I know a number of people who uh, they cling to the the church and they're like, but that one thing was a little askew uh, from their perspective. And I think what it's doing for lots of, especially the more conservative branch of uh, the modern LDS uh, church, what it's doing is it is further reinforcing this idea that the prophet is no, not much more than a glorified pastor, really, in terms of they have good teachings, it's helpful, yeah. uh, but they can be wrong about virtually everything and it doesn't really matter. Uh, they they only speak as a prophet when they are saying they're speaking as a prophet. And so it gives plausible deniability like crazy. They can teach uh, objectively, overtly false doctrine in conference, but perhaps they were speaking as a man, not as a prophet. And so things mm. like this where, um, you know, so many of these uh, conservative Mormons are, are feeling like, oh, man, I'm... That's kind of weird. I'm not sure if I agree with that. I, ha I have problems with that. I, it's just further reinforcing this idea that, well, that means that the prophet really can make giant mistakes and mm -hmm. still be a legitimate prophet of God. That makes it harder for them to then realize, uh, hey, the, the, fruits of the, the fruits of these guys are bad fruit. You look at Joseph mm -hmm. Smith, all the wacko stuff he did, they say, well, I mean, even now our prophets aren't perfect. They make mistakes. And so I guess it's okay. Joseph made mistakes. I think it's reinforcing that idea. Wow. It's like the bad fruit didn't come from the prophet tree. It just came from his person tree yeah exactly that's a great that's an interesting way to put that yeah. it's like that mm -hmm. doesn't it, but but it doesn't jive right and yeah. it's like it creates that cognitive dissonance that you were talking about in the the first episode that they live with like that's yeah. a legitimate form of cognitive distance yeah dissonance be like well he said these things wrong here in general conference but uh he wasn't speaking as the prophet though. exactly it's like well okay so if he only speaks as the prophet two percent of the time and the other 98% can be pretty whack. Uh, that's a little weird to yep. me. It's also a problem when you don't know what is uh, as a prophet and what's as a man. It's not like there's a big sign that flashes and says, this is as a prophet. You know, unless yeah. they give out a, a big proclamation, um, you don't really know. And yeah. man, that creates tons of plausible deniability. We literally, as Christians, mm -hmm. we hold our pastors to higher standards than Mormons hold their prophets to. Wow. Mm -hmm. If, if a uh, prophet stood up and started saying Adam was God... Um, they might be, oh, interesting. He might be wrong about that. If one of our pastors got up there and started preaching Adam was God, we'd stand up and be like, uh, we're going to talk about this, uh, usher him off, and then finish the sermon. You know, we'd be yeah. like, no, okay, hold on. Uh, seriously. And yeah. so um, that's a that's a huge, whole nother component of the future of the LDS Church, the pers their perspective on prophets and uh, the plausible deniability that they have and, and how wrong can a prophet be before he's a false prophet. Right. Well, even if you think about that, if you go back you know, to, I think it was around the somewhere around the 1970s when Bruce R. McConkie wrote the book Mormon Doctrine. Yeah. And I remember back in, you know, the early 2000s when I was like going through that book and we bring it out to our outreach, I just have as a reference. I remember there's actually somebody I talked to um, at the Christmas Lights outreach who, this Mormon man, he, was actually, he actually was holding a copy of Mormon Doctrine, like a younger guy. And, you know, we, we went back and forth and, and had a pretty uh, insightful conversation. And, but he, this is a guy like who knew his doctrine, who was very upfront about what he uh, believed that he was going to become a God one day. But if you notice, even then they were really trying to distance themselves from people like McConkie who are yeah. fundamentalists. And, and today I don't think there's anybody you, you if you pulled out Mormon doctrine, they're like, what is that? Like, yeah. they, so there's a huge distancing as well too what are you guys' thoughts on that oh man i you were saying that stuff but my brain was thinking of something totally different <laughs> i'm thinking about right now how the lds church is literally a pyramid scheme it's like a multi-level marketing pyramid scheme because it's like hey become good tithe paying members do x y and z work for us without us paying you and then at the top of the pyramid is the celestial kingdom mm. right like it's literally a pyramid scheme so that's what I was thinking in my head. So yeah, <laughs> you looked at me. So I been putting two people under you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't know. In terms of the the young man you're talking about, who actually you said that he was arguing for Mormon doctrine. Mormon doctrine, yes. I mean, he was somebody who was very standing behind a lot of what Bruce R. McConk was very upfront very about. Rare. Yeah. Um, which even then, I feel like that was a rarity for someone to stand behind when you'd hold out Mormon doctrine and you mention it. Like that's it became it was even back then it was even though. They would very much stand behind, hey, we're in the truth, you're apostate. They were kind of like, eh, yep. how they felt about, about McConkie. I hear tons of people, when I bring up anything that McConkie wrote, they're like, well, that wasn't official. You know, that was kind of his thoughts on stuff. And so a lot of the stuff they downplay as, uh, well, that was kind of just his 
thinking his ideas mm -hmm. and they put him in the same closet that Brigham Young is in you know, right. the, the, the crazy uncle upstairs uh, in the upstairs apartment they're like yeah McConkie's kind of up there with the Mormon doctrine stuff yeah. but I, a lot of people I've ran into are not even aware of it which is wild to me um, but the people that are aware yeah. I have very rarely come across someone uh, mm -hmm. doing street evangelism stuff who looks favorably upon Mormon doctrine it, all it is is it's a really straightforward um explanation of their doctrine it's actually right. really helpful if you just want to know without mincing words what have latter-day saints thought it's actually fairly helpful mm. for that but i think because of its intensity and its straightforwardness and uh the, the intense language that he used that's so not the culture of modern mormonism they're very uncomfortable with that idea yeah and that and that's and again that's all let's jump in here that's just well, i think what uh james white was referring to when he mentioned about the mormonism of the 70s yeah uh, that's what he was referring to what uh what were your thoughts? Yeah, like the the way that I've noticed that a lot of more modern, younger LDS people handle uh, things that they don't agree with by saying, you know, maybe that person wasn't, he wasn't speaking as a prophet, that person wasn't a prophet, that's not scripture. Well, they do the very same thing to biblical texts that they don't like. Mm -hmm. So as long as it doesn't fit in their worldview or like their presuppositions of the world, they just reject it yeah. outright. Like you can read something to them from the Bible and they go, that's probably a part, you know, I, I don't think that one's uh, interpreted correctly. You're yeah. just using your interpretation. It seems like anything that disagrees with their emotional experience that they've like created in their being, yep. they just reject it if, yep. it if it contradicts with that. That's mm -hmm. kind of what I've seen. I think the LDS church creates that kind of person. Yeah. They really do. It's like, well, if you don't agree with it, you're just going to reject it. Take what you like. Take the pieces that you want and just continue mm. to go there. It, it makes you a better person. This is when, when I uh, interact with Latter-day Saints on the street, I love going the route of testing. I, I use the language of testing all the time. So in Thessalonians, it says, uh, do not despise prophecy, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. Right. So I say, okay, so you have guys who are prophets. So they're giving prophecy. So I'm commanded by the Bible to not just despise that outright, okay, uh, but to test that. So uh, how do I test that? Well, I often will bring them to 1 John 4 and say, well, we test it against the, uh, the teaching of the apostles. Okay, so let's look here. If if we're commanded by uh, uh, revelation from God to, to test prophets by what the apostles have written, then you can't just say, well, you know, I'm not really sure about that interpretation. Well, hold on. This is what God has given for you as the testing material here. So every, the Book of Mormon, all the teachings of the modern prophets, the Bible is what we test that against. And I get a lot of people say like, okay, all right, fair. So let's deal with this text now. And then we you know, try and hold the feet their feet to the fire a little bit and be like, what does it mean when it says God is not a man? Mm. What is it when it, it, the Bible says that j exactly in those words, God is not a man. You have to deal with that. Oh, so what's going on? And so sometimes that testing language I find is really helpful when uh, talking with Latter-day Saints about that. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So again, what you're seeing here is a huge change and, and, and shift from somebody like Brigham Young, who said, I never preach a sermon unto the sons of man, which they might not call scripture mm. versus now where, if I was to listen to whatever Russell M. Nelson talked about, essentially everything that he said up there at the LDS conference as the leader, the president, the prophet, everything really is taken with a grain of salt. Well, I don't know if he really meant that. Is that, is that what you're saying then? I'm saying I, I don't know if they would say officially that's supposed to be the case, but that is certainly practically the case. When mm. you talk with uh, street level Latter-day Saints, uh, that's exactly what they think. Well, we'll take some and leave some, you know, chew on it, spit out the bones. Uh, some of that was good. But quite honestly, with a, all of the modern conferences, they don't really teach that much in way of doctrine. A lot of yeah. it is very like, you know, love your families, care for them well. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and uh, who's going to say that that's false? So uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, I love conference because of all that. But it's really not doctrinal stuff. So while I think that's the case, exactly what you said, uh, they go there and they'll kind of pick and choose what they want, whether or not they're supposed to. They don't really have to uh, because prophets aren't really saying much these days. Right, right. And so let me ask you this. We talked earlier about... Uh, polygamy, like what if the laws change yeah. and historically uh, the LDS church has always bowed their knee to the state, whether you look at the issue of uh, blacks in the priesthood um, or any of the, or had them immediately pulling back on polygamy when they're going to be exiled to Mexico. You know, that's just historically, they've always tried to fit into the current zeitgeist. So when we were out there um, this past weekend, there is somebody out there who uh, was holding a sign and said, held a hug, a LDS transgender yeah. uh, person. So it was a, 
um, you know, a 60, probably a 50, 60 year old man uh, who was mistakenly believed that uh, he was a woman. Um, and, you know, and, but it was just interesting because, you know, as somebody who's a Christian and man, I want to have compassion on that person. Then mm. unfortunately there were people out there, the fundamentalist street screechers who were saying horrible derogatory things that just sad me and made me angry. But, you know, we need to view those people with compassion. But I found it very interesting that, a lot of the younger people, especially people saw uh, this, this uh, man uh, in a very positive light, this yeah. man wearing a dress and high heels and was holding up the sign. And um, it would just, it seemed to be very view, viewing him in a very much a positive light. I don't think there's anybody who saw who was on the LDS side. Who's who was like, Oh, you know, what are you doing is wrong or what's going on here. And so I think that's also just indicative of the current age of the church and really the, the age gap where you have people who are 90, years old, you know, in the, in the leadership, but then you have the younger TikTok generation, uh, who's really into all the LGBTQ transgender, like you name it. Yep. That's a big part of the culture. Where do you think this is going when it comes to the Mormon church? Cause we know things are coming down the pipeline. We've already had the redefinition of marriage during the Obama administration and things are just, this is a trajectory the culture's headed, Yep. but they're right alongside of it. Where yep. do you, where does the LDS church go from here? I'm just, uh, what are your guys' yeah. thoughts? You know, in lots of ways, the church tracks behind other states. So what we see culturally in uh, the various U.S. states, the Mormon church is a decade behind that trajectory. So um, if you ask most non-Mormons in Utah, everyone is pretty much in agreement that eventually uh, they will approve of same-sex ceilings in the temples, eventually, down the road. Uh, if you ask um, Latter-day Saints, 70, 60, 70% of people that we get into that conversation are like, oh yeah, it's coming soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm there already. We're just waiting for the prophets to get the word. Uh, mm-hmm. And then and then that'll be instituted. Now, that, that again, that's in Provo. So that's, uh, you know, uh, younger age, BYU-ish age um, uh, people. But that is jef- definitely the feel that you get from people. The desire is, yeah, we really want to be inclusive to this whole um, branch of uh, of people. Um, and so uh, I think that eventually, probably, that will be where the church ends up. A straight up approval of um, the same-sex marriages, transgenderism, um, stuff like that. But I am, I think, perhaps in a minority of lots of Christians. Uh, mm-hmm. Lots of Christians think that this is going to happen imminently, you know, in the next couple of years. I think that if we look at the age of the, and the, the generation of the current uh, leadership, the apostles, uh, first presidency and whatnot, I think that they are very much removed from a lot of the kind of culture of younger Mormonism. So my thinking is that will come, but I think uh, the younger generations need to get into that upper echelon of leadership before we start seeing those changes. Yeah. So I think it's still a decade, a couple decades out personally. I could be wrong. You know, who knows yeah. what's going to happen, but well, that's my thinking. What are, uh, one other question too, and you can jump in as well too, Andrew, is that um, with, I, like, well, I get where you'd hold position. It's still, as long as there's the older, you know, the quorum of the 12, like the 12 who are all in their 90s and this is a ways off. One of the things that James mentioned at the very beginning about a charismatic leader uh, who could fill in the gap. So thinking about the younger generation, you look at right now in the culture, uh, what's going on right now, like the Florida, the don't say gay bill, right? And so people are just immediately jumping on, uh, completely mischaracterizing this bill. But it's just, it's a hugely emotional uh, topic that really it's that younger generation, that younger demographic, that that's the pulse of the marketplace of the conversation going on right now. Do you think it's possible that you could have somebody come in who's kind of like a charismatic Mormon, younger Mormon leader says, hey, come and follow me, but we're going to have LGBT and gender inclusion. And if you've been excluded from the church or do you think that gap or that vacuum, do you think there, there's an opportunity for that to be filled in? I'm curious what you think, Andrew. Uh, w- what I'm thinking right now is I don't think that they're – they don't have a God, right? There is no revelation coming from God. So there's an impetus and there is a motive, but that motive I believe is uh, dollar bills, right? So they've got a hundred billion dollars, if not a little bit more uh, now. So when those things start dwindling, I think changes start occurring, right? Since they're not actually getting revelation from God, the impetus comes from some type of structure. What I, I agree uh, heavily with Bradley that it's going to take some time because we've got a lot of people who are boomers, 
like in the, in the upper echelon or even before that, the generation before the boomers. And they need to kind of get replaced by the more young Mormons coming from BYU. They, they are those young ones at BYU. That's the future. Yeah. But that's a generation or two away from what we're seeing now. But I find it very hard for any movement to try to usher in LGBTQ when that, that whole structure of people is against having children right against even procreating like in the LDS church, they want procreating tithe members, members, right? So how can you add that to a structure when it, when your impetus, I would say is dollar bills when it wouldn't actually add anything to you. You know what I mean? It's actually yeah. going to take away marriage. It's going to take away children. It's going to make uh, these, these lines muddied and blurried. I'd say any movement that comes from a young person who may call themselves a prophet and create this other separate church, I'd say maybe it'll last for 15 or 20 years, but it would probably die out because they're not going to have children. They're not going to be procreating. Yeah. I, it's interesting. I think that you're more likely to see someone come up. I think it was um, pastor James who was saying this, but I think you're more likely to see someone come up on the conservative end, not on the liberal end. If you're going to have someone come up and kind of, um, you know, be the, the leader mm. of this new movement, another church, or even within the church, a, a, a more structurally distinct conservative branch. I, I think it would be on the conservative side. A reformation mm. in a sense. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's more likely uh, than a liberal leader. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Be, honestly, partially because the church keeps trending liberal, yeah. uh, usually you're not going to have a breakaway in the direction that things are already going. You're mm. going to have a breakaway in the other direction. And so since it's trending liberal, um, the breakaway is going to be in the conservative direction if it happened at all. Um, it's almost like a generational battle, right? Between yeah. uh, the grandparents, the parents, and the children of the LDS church. That's what we're seeing right now because they're the grandparents that hold the upper echelon, like the power of influence throughout the LDS church. And then we have the generation after them, which is like the baby boomers, right? Like my parents. And then then from there, we have, we have us. We have like the millennials, Gen Z, and those people. We're seeing an actual a disintegration of the family unit as a whole within the LDS organization, because there's no cohesion, a place yep. that's all about family in their religion and eternal families. You can see that they have a lot of dysfunction just because of the differing views between each generation. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of a mind mm -hmm. mind blowing. If you think about <laughs> it's it, it's funny you say that I oftentimes I'll have a conversation with someone who's an older generation. And then the next conversation is with, you know, a couple teenagers who are down in Provo. And I'm like, I really wish you guys could, come with me and talk to this older dude because yeah. I don't know that you guys are both aware that the other exists. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're like, Oh, we have, you know, we have never taught that the younger generation. We've never, the church has never said that we've always said X, Y, Z. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm, I, I mean, I'm an outsider. I know that, but yeah. I'm telling you, I just talked with a guy who said the exact opposite. So mm -hmm. you need to know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I may mean, didn't you talk about a funny story real quick between like a generational gap. There's a story that Jeff had um, where he was out in the street at the LDS temple and he was talking to some younger missionaries and there's an older man that he was also talking with as well too. You know the story. And um, he would just, Jeff was pushing on him. It's like, well, you believe you can become a God one day. Right. And he goes, you, and he was trying to get him to say it. And it was like, he knew the missionary knew that he knew. And he was kind of, whatever Jeff had said, he kind of put him into, into a corner where he had to respond. So he was trying to like, you know, wishy-wash around it and not answer the question. He's like, well, you know, and so Jeff basically looked at the older guy next to the younger missionary. He said, well, what do you believe about this? And the younger and the older guy was like, yes, I'm going to become a God of my own planet. And it's right over there. And he pointed to this one area, like in the sky. <laughs> So you talk about, we, I think we've all had those like stories when you've gone out to the temple, like a unique conversation yeah. that happened, but that's an example too of the generational gap. You have a guy who's like extremely bold in their proclamation of wanting to become a God and having their exaltation. And then there's a generational gap between when Hinckley made that distinction on 60 minutes where that was a huge catalyst versus this younger man who was like, eh, it's more like returning to our heavenly father. Yeah. We're just trying to change the link, say the same thing, but it but completely, you know, change the lingo yeah. behind it. Yeah, I, totally, totally. Uh, I, I, if you talk to missionaries, especially, and you say like, so you know, we, you guys think we can become gods? And they're like, no, 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 we, we don't think that. I've heard that all the time, and I'm like, okay. Um, do you believe that if we adhere to all the laws and ordinances that we need to, we can be exalted in the celestial kingdom? Well, yes, yeah. 
does that mean that we will have, you know, a, a kind of power and authority and right to be even perhaps worshipped someday? And they're like, well, I guess you could say that. I'm like, do you think that we might create our own planets and have our own spirit children who could worship us? Yeah, I mean, we don't really know all the details, but we think so. I'm like, yeah. so I call that being a god. Right. Can we use that? And they're like, I... I guess if you want to word it like that, yes, then we can become gods. So it's really interesting because they don't necessarily deny the idea, but they're aware that it's uncomfortable to say. Mm. It's very interesting. They're, the ideas are still there if you ask a couple questions deep, but they're like, oh man, that language doesn't sound good. Like We recognize, uh, perhaps even naturally, perhaps because of what God has done in the heart of mankind. Ooh. Like They know yeah. wow. that's... Not right. They're I don't like, like that. Like, language. slow down. That's lesson five. Mm, that's <laughs> lesson <laughs> five. <laughs> We're not even yeah. on the lessons yet, buddy. <laughs> yeah. No, that's actually a, that's actually a line from the Ed Decker uh, Walter yeah. Martin uh, thing. That's I was I love that. <laughs> So we're, we're talking like in bite-sized pieces. We're kind of looking at unique, distinct categories when it's like theological or just the organizational aspects of Mormonism. And you know, now with you being here, like six months, kind of really seeing the byproduct of embedded culture. You know, we're talking about cultish embedded. I think like the aesthetic of Salt Lake is interesting um, just because it, it has this aesthetic of very, very pretty on the outside, but a lot of brokenness on the inside. I think as I was driving in here, you know, one of the things that, you know, Way talked about when we had a uh, Salt Lake City in the Future Occultish, when he was on uh, the show right before you guys planted, is that one of the biggest, uh, mar- it's one of the biggest marketplaces of anywhere for plastic surgery and, and for Botox and all the things that turn you into a perfect, good looking Stepford wife. And I saw like one or two signs, uh, like bi- bi- giant billboards for that. So that's like one example of the culture as a whole. But like, what are some examples too, not just in, um, that you've seen in Utah uh, since you've been here, um, like in the six months, like how do you see the more, how do you see the current state of Mormonism, but like blood out through the culture you see here in Salt Lake? Yeah. So I'll, I'll say it this way. Like, when you are saved by the grace of God and he puts his spirit within you, it says he causes you to observe his statutes, right? There's a real thing that changes where you, you then have fruits of the spirit, like gentleness, patience, self-control, all of these things that start coming through a life of walking in relationship with God. But what you see out here in Salt Lake city is we, we say it all the time. These are, these are, these are great people. They're so awesome to be around. They have, they love family. They love those things. But what's going on is they're actually taking biblical principles from the Bible and they're aping them for themselves, right? So, of course, they're going to emulate good things that we would want even Christian people to do. But this is is the sad reality of Utah. There's a beautiful external appearance, but internally they don't have the Holy Spirit. So imagine being a people, being a culture, being a city that tries to mimic the fruits of the spirit when you don't actually have the spirit of God. Do you know how hard that is to do? Because you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. So what does that do? It creates broken homes, broken families. It creates sin being unconfessed. It creates problems, right? It creates all kinds of issues. And you see that within the the people of Salt Lake City, Utah. You, You see it. It's a beautiful place, but it's a place that's full of no hope. Because it's a false gospel that's being preached and people are trying to mimic the works and actions of the Holy Spirit with actually, without actually being changed. There's mm. no heart change. It's, it's not good. It's a, it's a Band-Aid. It's painful. Uh, so w- what we got to understand about the people out here when we have conversations with them is we got to believe what God says about them. Like in the conversations that they seem so good, they'll talk about these great things, but you look them in the eye and you say, you know what? The Bible and what God says about you is that you don't have peace with God. Mm. And I know you don't have peace with God. I don't care about what you tell me essentially in terms of how happy you are, how, how, how great things are. I know it's not true. We have to appeal to the words of God. And I see that's what Salt Lake City is like. Like people have great cars. Uh, there's great money out here. But lots of Teslas out here. Lots of Teslas out here. But deep down inside, there's this, uh, it's, it's an illusion of happiness. It's an illusion of these things. Like we're supposed to be storing up heavenly treasures, right? And I don't see any evidence of that being out here in the majority of the people that I've spoken with that, that, mm. are, that are LDS, that, that aren't saved. Unfortunately, and I want them to know the true and living God. So I'm not trying to sound like 
someone who's saying these people are bad people. No, they're right. people that are in need of a savior mm-hmm. and they're trying to do things and mimic the works of the Holy Spirit without actually having the Holy Spirit. And that's called a yoke. That's called a burden. That's something you will never be able to do and it will destroy you. It'll destroy you. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I was thinking uh, the whole time you were talking about uh, this pervasive sense of dissatisfaction. Um, that uh, it's not it's not just that uh, people are broken. A lot of times they you you could uh, you know, talk to people and they're like, oh, my life is pretty good. I actually have a lot of stuff, but I'm not satisfied. Mm. And the whole point of Mormonism is individual happiness. I mean, if you just straight up ask. Latter-day Saints, what is the point of life? Well, to be happy, to be with my family for all of eternity, stuff like that. The misplaced aim and goal of Mormonism trickles down into their lives. Biblically, we exist for the glory of God. Amen. We exist for his glory. We're saved for his glory. Uh, we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit for his glory. And so as Christians, we can have nothing. But if we have the Lord... If we are being sanctified, if we are conformed to the image of the Son, we can be satisfied. Mm-hmm. This is why Paul says, you know, I can be content in every circumstance, every situation, because the the purpose of my existence is fulfilled in being a Christian. Mormons, if for them, if the end goal is happiness, well, you need things to become happy. Mm. And if you can't get those things, or if those things are temporary, or if uh, they break or they mm. fracture, well, my, my perfect family, we're going to dwell together, but my my son, um, he went off the deep end. He's no longer a member of the church. Now he's an atheist. Suddenly my happy family is not here. And, and how can I be satisfied without all of my family in the celestial kingdom? And so it's not just a matter of brokenness. It's a, a matter of pervasive dissatisfaction. Amen. And that creates kind of this atmosphere of depression and anxiety. Mm. And that's where you get all of the, uh, uh, you know, um, the drug problems and the you know, pres- uh, prescription drug issues and whatnot is, I think, because of the sense of I can't be happy. And that's the point. That's, I, that's my whole reason for existence. Wow. It's because they don't understand that we exist for the glory of God. And that is such a sweet thing to recognize it it brings us rest and hope it means that my entire life can be taken away i can lose every material thing but at the end of the day uh, the lord has put me here the lord is good i exist for his glory i've been saved by the blood of christ so i can be content i can be Mm. satisfied i wish we had a preach button preach (laughs) preach no that's good and um i think when uh people ask we were talking about earlier like where is this all headed you know ultimately we don't have a we don't have a completely like prophetic lens where we can see exactly to the T of what will happen, you know, when these elder uh, you know, men pass away and the younger generations come along, but we do know two things. One, it has a foundation uh where it's not going to stand, uh very much in the sense of the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Mm. But ultimately we know that all things are going to be put under the feet of Jesus as well too, including uh the false gospel propagated by Joseph Smith. But as we're here, and as the Mormon Church eventually, uh, it is going to crumble uh, at some point. You know, we don't, we're not here. It's not enough that the Mormon Church just collapses or that people would leave the church. There's plenty of people who do that, who end up becoming atheists or agnostic. But the real heart cry and mission of cultish is that people would come out of the cults, would come out of the New Age to know Christ, as Walter Martin said. Uh, we always quote him in our, uh, we have that little clip in our intro that says, you're in a cult, I love you, I want you out of it, and with Christ. Let's talk just real quickly as we wrap up here. What are some pinnacle examples of, as Christians, kind of like a how then shall we live? How can we reach out to our Mormon friends and neighbors? How can we uh, be the fragrance of Christ to uh, the people in trapped in this organization as it trajects into this postmodern chaos. Uh, how do we approach this issue? How do we bring the gospel into the conversation of uh, to our Mormon friends and neighbors? What are you guys' thoughts as we wrap up here? First, invite them over to your house. Seriously, your neighbors. If you're if you're around Latter Day Saints or there's a ward in your community, find them, invite them for dinner, and get to know them. I mean, you're gonna. Sp- struggle to um, have a good uh, relational evangelistic context if you don't have any relationships with Latter-day Saints. So invite them over for dinner, get to know their families, and also be very straightforward 
about the gospel. I think one of the things that gets really hard for Christians, especially in Utah, is uh, you're friends with your neighbors and you only talk about golf or uh, sports, and then suddenly it's been a year living there, and now it's weird. You've not talked about the gospel. You've not talked about faith at all. You've not talked about the differences. And so when you bring it into the conversation, it's weird. Listen, invite them over for invite them over for dinner and be really straightforward. Hey, I'm a Christian. Have you ever interacted with a Christian before? Do you mind if I, um, you know, just take a couple of minutes and walk you through what we think about the gospel and whatnot? I'd love to hear what you guys think and what you believe. And if you just start that conversation and you maintain a relationship, it'll, it's amazing how often people will bring up uh, things of faith, uh, will bring up their ideas and their problems. A lot of times, people in the LDS church, because their communities within their wards are so tight-knit, it's very parish model, right? So your neighbors are the same people you go to church with. Sometimes they're have, having struggles at home or issues, and they don't want the neighbors in the church to know because then their whole their whole congregation knows, their ward knows. They might feel awkward and shamed about that. And so I've heard lots of stories of Christians getting kind of being an ear to a lot of the problems and things that go on. And that's a fantastic position to be in you can minister to that with the gospel. You can talk about some of those things straightforwardly. One thing I'm really convicted about concerning Mormonism is to not treat Mormons um, as though they're uh, kids. We don't play with kid gloves. You know, mm-hmm. you can address things head on. You don't have to be like really sly and never talk about the doctrines. No, just be straightforward. They're humans. They can, you know, interact with them with dignity, with respect. You don't mock them. You don't, uh, you don't laugh at them. You don't say, oh, this is so stupid. No, listen and handle it with dignity, but be straightforward. You know, I think the Bible actually teaches something really different uh, than that. And that's what I believe. Do you mind if I just explain that? And I think you'd be surprised how many people are willing to hear you out and listen. And so I think being, uh, it, yeah, inviting your neighbors over for dinner, preaching the gospel to them straightforwardly, um, not being ashamed of the gospel, not being embarrassed about it, not thinking it's weird. I think that if we normalize that, that's a, that's a huge service. It's not really profound. It's not really crazy. It's just what Christians do, you know? Hmm. Yeah, it's just gener- in generational faithfulness, right? Mm-hmm. Like the the cults are the unpaid debts of the church, man. And the Christians for so long haven't been being the salt and the light. You know, it's just like what Bradley's mm-hmm. saying. Be a Christian. Yeah, These exactly. are things that Christians do. Have conversations. Get in, get in, get in those conversations. Preach the gospel and, and be that light. Be that salt and the light. I mean, yeah. that's really what, that's what Salt Lake City needs, right? We need mm-hmm. generational faithfulness. And yeah. I, I believe in time. When the Lord puts that in the hearts of men out here, this city will change mm-hmm. to the glory of God, right? It, it will happen. It, it just takes a matter of time. Gener- generational faithfulness in Christians yeah. being Christians. Yeah, and I would say too, um, you know, get start start equipping yourself too on resources. Yeah. Um, like mm. you get a copy of uh, Letters to a Mormon Elder by James White. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, do you, are, what are some other recommended resources that you would say that like, people can get like good books or just yeah. like, things um, people can kind of get into to get equipped? It depends on kind of uh, what you want to learn. If you're just trying to learn like a uh, background history of the LDS Church, uh, MRM.org, Mormonism Research Ministry, they have a really great stuff. Really faithful guys. They've been laboring for decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have some really good just research. Specific specific stuff on the history of the church and different things that come out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think our, our stuff, God Those Mormons, uh, part of what we try yep. and do is uh, create videos that not only are helpful for uh, Latter-day Saints or people leaving the LDS church, but also for Christians. Be like, hey, here are the here are the 10 verses in the New Testament that talk about why we don't need temples. But you yeah. should know this. Just go through. And so yeah. I think some of our uh, material would be good for that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. I think also just um, become start becoming familiar with some of the basic tenets of Mormon doctrine. Like yep. I would say go out of your way to memorize the articles of faith. Mm. I think that'd be pretty, a lot of them, as soon as you mention that, I feel like that's been a huge, um, you know, conversation starter, quoting to them the third article of faith about what they believe in regards to salvation and say, Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this verse? And, and kind of bringing that up. That's a huge catalyst. Yeah. Um, also I would say too, uh, if you, uh, order a book of Mormon, uh, I was just you're, you're just this. yeah. Yep. Literally I love the pit, give the pitch that you had. Like, I <laughs> no, love yeah. the, Order a book of Mormon and a pair of missionaries come attached. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> seriously, dead yeah. serious. And uh, honestly, if you're if you're listening and you just don't know much about the LDS Church, but you have a heart uh, to do outreach to Mormons, invite missionaries over. Yeah, uh, seriously, the, these guys they're they're genuine. Um, they're good to talk to. Uh, they're lost. They need the gospel. Yeah, uh, invite them over and ask legitimate questions. You will fall into all the traps. <laughs> and good, learn the traps. Learn that like wow, we had that conversation and we. 
they agreed with us. Why? They shouldn't have agreed with us. I don't right. understand. Right. And talk to the missionaries, and uh, they're very representative of uh, young Mormons. And mm-hmm. so if you, you can learn the doctrine from them, you can kind of learn some of the cultural ticks of modern Mormonism. I think that's honestly a really great, great yeah. way to learn. Ask questions. And, and if you're not sure how to talk to Mormon missionaries, uh, this uh, we, it just so happens we have an episode called How to Talk to Mormon Missionaries. <laughs> uh, look that up. It's in our archive. You type in just Mormon, Mormon missionaries, you'll see, I think we did like three or four episodes with Dan Tate. Four, yeah. And I think there's also a precursor to that series called Inside the Life of a Mormon Missionary, where we were just talking with Dan about what it's what is it what was it really like for him when he was a missionary in the Bible Belt of Florida, and so it'll give you a good understanding. And also the one with uh, Micah Wilder, Micah Wilder, Michael Wilder, yeah. and yeah, so he Adams was Road, Adams Road. So he was on our show too. I think that's a great like read his book. It gives you just a good understanding of who these young men and women are. And it allows you also to see them as people. Yeah. Like so many times, I think in the world of apologetic, we're so, we're so, so we're so much in a hurry just to get that right answer to refute them and to smack them down. And it's like our goal is, we don't need to worry about being right. Like our goal is not to be, or to win the argument. Like that's not the case. Like you want to just love on them, have your speech be seen with salt, give them the gospel, and and pray that the the Holy Spirit would bring them conviction, would open their eyes. But I think. In many ways, that look what Mike did. He allowed. Uh, he, it really. When I read this book, when I looked, talked to him, like it really helped reinforce the idea. That these are just. These are just young kids yeah. who are two years away from their family and are you know just experiencing a part of the world they're not used to, and so there's a lot of variables where you want to be bold and and preach the truth to them, but. Yeah, Passport to Heaven yes. is, is his book. And then his mother's book, Lynn Wilder's uh, Unveiling Grace, Unveiling Grace, is also yes. excellent. Those two I really recommend. Yeah, so ultimately I think you know we need to be the fragrance of Christ and uh, bring all, and come alongside and, and just initiate conversations. And you know, at the end of the day, like where where's it headed? How's it going to affect Lo- Salt Lake City long term? We don't know. We're just called to be faithful. You know, mm-hmm. we want to keep, keep on making more content with cultists. You want to keep on being faithful with Apology of Salt Lake and you're going to do what you do with, you know, at the Mission Church and with Godless Mormons. And I think you just got to live to the fullest of where God's called you yeah. and uh, know that he's going to do the work. I mean, in fact, it's one of those really encouraging things. I think um, when I was out here in uh, the place on th- Thursday, where are we going Thursday? Provo. Provo. We, we were in Provo. Um, you know, it was just, I could like sense the darkness. Just, it was like, you could like feel it. And for me, it was like heavy and, but in it, I, I was feeling just a little bit overwhelmed. Like, man, I don't know. Is like, are we really doing any good here? And you kind of having those self doubts. And it just so happens to, we came across a couple people that night who had come to Christ. One from Apologia, the, the, the gospel from one's video that Jeff did, that's got, you know, half a million views. And then there were a couple of young ladies who came to Christ really. And Coltish was a catalyst for that. Wow. And so Praise here, God. here I am sort of like, Oh man, you're like, yeah, it's like self doubt. And all of a sudden a couple of people come along where like God's worked. And it's like, okay. The Lord yeah. encouraged you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And realize that God is always, he's always doing something. Yeah. You know, it's like when Jesus says, right now you don't know what I'm doing, understand what I'm doing, but later you will. And just trust that God's called you where he's placed you to be. Yeah. First Corinthians, uh, the beginning of it, when um, it I planted, Apollos watered, but it's God who gives the growth. Amen. Faithfulness yeah. is the true success of ministry. Being mm. Faithful, uh, persevering, enduring um, amidst hardship, amidst uh, resistance. You just go back to scripture, you go back to the gospel, and you press on for God's glory because that's the goal. It's God's glory. Oh, yeah. Amen. Cool. Well, I think that's a pretty, uh, this is the volume two of the postmodern maze of Mormonism. I'm sure we'll probably jump back in down the road. I think that was around, gosh, that was like around the first couple of us. That would have been like the beginning of 2019 when we, uh, when we did that. So here we are 2022, all these years later. So we'll probably do another volume down the road, just as far as just kind of like the talk about the current state of affairs in Mormonism. Cause that really is our bread and butter. That's where we came from initial with LDS outreach, apology at church and apology studios was initially apology of Christian ministries, which was primarily a counter cult uh, ministry, like focusing primarily on uh, LDS, but also Jehovah's witnesses and a couple other uh, different cults and world religions. And uh, here we are all these years, these years later. So, Uh, We always love jumping in here. So all that being said, if you guys enjoyed this episode, uh, go ahead and leave a comment on our social media. Let us know what you thought. And as always, a program like this cannot continue without your support. So if you feel led to give and to support Cultish, go to thecultishshow.com. You can donate one time or monthly. So all that being said, uh, Bradley, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thanks for having uh, me. It was great. Yeah. So God loves Mormons on YouTube. That's people can find you. Yep. 
and lots of great content over there. So thanks for hanging out, and we'll talk to you guys next time on Cultish, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you guys soon.